I was watching the Curd Aid benefit the other day and there was a big controversy. A lot of the acts were upset because all the money went to help the plight of the Kurds and none of it went to help the Bangladesh cyclone victims. But to be fair, the Bangladesh cyclone wasn't actually our fault. But I was interested to see that uh, the, the power behind the whole thing was Geoffrey Archer. Geoffrey Archer wanted to give money to the Kurds. I hope he wasn't expecting sex in return. And I know they're an attractive people, but I think he'd be exploiting the situation rather. But uh, John Major, of course, has the answer to the Kurdish problem, which is the lovely Safe Havens plan, which sounds so nice and quaint, saying Safe Havens, like the Bidawi refugee camp. But I, I'm glad, though, that the Gulf War did happen, because, of course, it has brought peace and stability to the Middle East, which is a great weight off my mind. It's an absolute mill pond out there now. But I think it didn't bode very well for the stability of the region, that the Americans now give wars names that sound like movies. Desert Storm was so successful that Desert Storm 2, 3, 4 and 5 already in the pipeline. And there are those people who say, what we should have done is finish Saddam off, get in there and do him in. But of course that was never part of the game plan, because Saddam will have to be rehabilitated in a couple of years. He'll be over the White House having a laugh with George, talking about how it was all ghastly mistake, and he'll have married somebody who buys a lot of shoes. And it'll all just be cracking good fun, and they'll all be having a laugh about the good old days, and, and uh, talking about the fact that the real enemies are now the Swiss since they discovered a clockwork car that runs on chocolate. But it wasn't so very long ago that Iraq was our big mates, as I remember. It was Iran that we hated, correct me if I'm wrong, but Iraq and Iran were at war, and we hated Iran. They were the wild dogs, the mad-eyed towel heads of Islam that we hated. And because they were at war with Iraq, Iraq was our big mates. Anybody that didn't like Iran was our mates. Now, Iran's our mates because it's Iraq that we hate, and Iraq and Iran are still not mates, and we hate Iraq and we like Iran. I don't know if this war was a foreign policy shift or just a typing error. And, of course, the trouble is, when they were at war, Iraq and Iran, we gave Iraq a lot of weapons to fight Iran with. But there was nothing in the contract that said they had to use them all up on Iran. So what was left over, we got back on sale or return. But, of course, the Dan Hussein's a bastard. I mean, obviously he's a bastard. I'm not trying to, to, to deify the bloke. Obviously he's a bastard. You wouldn't be able to shift a lot of arms to him if he, if he wasn't. I mean, you can't peddle nerve gas to somebody like Alistair Sim. But, I mean, that there had to be a complete demonisation of Saddam for the war to take place properly. They had to, you know, do the whole stuff about plucky little Kuwait and all of that stuff. Shame they turned out to be a bunch of bastards, wasn't it, really? But they had to really demonise the fellow. So when all the hostages came back, everyone was waiting for all the hostages to get off the plane at Heathrow and say what a terrible time they'd all had out there. And when they described their experiences, I thought... Well, I've been treated worse by global holidays. 24 hours in Iraqian airport, that's torture. And then those airmen, those airmen fell out of their aeroplanes and got a bit bruised looking and went on the television and, uh, you know, slagged off the war. And they all came over back home and everyone was, you know, saying, go on, they beat you up, didn't they? They beat you up. They were saying, no, no. Said, no, they did. They, they said, no, honestly, they fucking did beat you up. And, of course, everyone was very quick. They went on the television, all these airmen, they went on the television and said they all slagged off the war, right? And everyone was extremely quick to believe that their statements were beaten out of them. Whereas if you're Irish, it's 16 years before people believe that. And let's face it, those airmen were actually guilty of bombing offences. But the whole coverage of the war was so weird. I mean, in the old days, when you had a war, like, say, Vietnam, right, you had people like James Cameron and John Pilger on the scene. It was, it was all serious stuff, but this war was just show business. People like CNN News going, Well, we see war is not pretty, but here comes a really cute missile. This one's like a little firecracker. War is coming pretty close. Let's so get out here, yikes. And even the Radio 4 people went out of their minds. Now, Radio 4, you expect a bit of gravitas and solemnity. Dogger, Fisher, German bite. Radio 4 is the sort of stuff they play to long-term psychiatric patients. But even they went out of their minds, they're all saying, well, it really is very exciting to be out in the thick of things, right out in the front line of the world. It really is most exhilarating feeling indeed. I can't tell you quite how exciting it is. And, oh, I haven't had so much fun since the Armenian earthquake. I really haven't. And all the telly ones got given by the army, those trendy, chic, combat, chic, leaf green camouflage jackets, just in case the Iraqis had a sandy gall seeking missile. So there they all were on the television, not showing any bias at all, dressed in military wear, and, and they were all in these leaf green combat jackets. But I think the army was taking the piss when they gave them to them, because you might have noticed that the army had sand-coloured camouflage. Because that's the thing with camouflage, you see, you've got to stand against the right thing. 
Maybe the reporters thought they were going to drag a load of houseplants into battle behind them. And of course, because there was a complete media blackout of the whole thing, nobody was allowed to actually say anything about the war. There was 24-hour coverage and nobody was allowed to say anything. So what they did, they got people who'd been involved in campaigns in the past to come on and talk about stuff and to sort of, just to sort of guess what might be happening. So they'd say, well, we can't actually put our finger on exactly what is happening in the desert at the moment, but we have got with us Brigadier Sir Keith Cumshot, who was involved in the campaign to thwart the Orpington Bypass of 1962. Well, of course, Kent County Council, a remarkably similar adversary to the lead Republican Guard. And they had lots of interviews as well with soldiers. And I'd always fostered this fond liberal illusion that people join the army because they're all unemployed and desperately poor, and I'm from Liverpool, obviously, and they join up as a way out of the slums. This is, their, this is their only future, so they join the army, so you can't blame them. But they didn't show any of them on the telly. They didn't have soldiers saying, look, it's just like getting myself on my feet, so I ain't you. Look, I was out of work, what was I gonna do? Join the busies. Look, it won't be dangerous, I'll stand near the back, all right? Maybe they couldn't go on camera because they'd all told their girlfriends they were supermarket managers in Riyadh. But instead of them, they show the hard case, serious, home counties type soldiers who were well up for it. And uh, there was this phony war period. They shipped all our brave boys out there and nothing happened. I mean, obviously, they had to put it off till after Christmas because what with the post and everything, it'd be hopeless. But they had them all waiting and so they were all being interviewed about how they were keen to start. And they were all going, well, I think now we're all pretty keen to get out there and uh, to commence the job which we were trained to do, obviously uh, a lot of training went into the job that uh, we were trying to do and we've been here now, we've been waiting and doing a little bit more training, not very much more training because obviously we were trained to do the job that we were trained to do and uh, we've had a long wait now and I think we're all pretty keen uh, to get out there and start killing some people. It's been a very long, tense waiting period uh, since the Falklands War. I haven't killed anybody myself, a couple of paddies but they weren't armed, there's no challenge is it? And the army officers were mad as well. They're all barking loopers. They're all the Sandhurst types. They're all saying, well, we're very surprised indeed about the extremely low level of civilian casualties. There's a remarkably small number and there's a terribly tiny number. I'm quite disappointed myself. I really am. Oh, war's an absolute shower. I don't know what's gone wrong. And I think the people who came out worst from the war was not the people who were well up for it, because if you're a bloodthirsty, crazed old looper, well, fair enough. The people who came out of the war worst morally, I think, were those Labour MPs who were against the war until it started and then magically were in favour of it. It was like, but we're all right then, but make it a quick one. You really, you are the limit, you and your wars. And this is the last time I'm telling you, God. But everyone was mightily pissed off, of course, with Germany and Japan, because Germany and Japan didn't want to get involved in the fighting. Got no stomach for war, that's what's wrong with them. But of course, our relationship with our cousins across the pond, America, was cemented because these two bastions, the pillars of the motherfuckers of democracy, uh, uh, you know, we were united and it was all very touching and lovely. And the Queen went out, you know, over to America. And then, of course, I mean, it was announced that uh, in Britain we were going to ban the American football terrier two days after the Queen had just knighted him. And, you know, it was, it was, it was touching, though, to see our two countries united in that way because... I, we have such a good relationship with the Americans. I mean, even when they blow our tanks up, it's friendly fire, which is lovely. But, of course, they were great pra praise for the Prime Minister, Mr John Major. They had to carry on saying, all through the war, the Prime Minister, Mr John Major, because you still couldn't quite believe it, really. Oh, fuck, it wasn't a dream. But they, the Prime Minister won great praise because he didn't conduct Thatcher's kind of a war. You know, I mean... He didn't have the, after the war, he didn't have the full-scale Thatcher victory jamboree with Ted Rogers carrying the severed heads of Iraqi generals down the mall. He just had a sort of quiet do in Scotland, a few friends, a few things on sticks. But uh, uh, people said it was marvellous, this war, because it wasn't carried out with Thatcher's bloodthirsty swagger and belligerent bellicose bluster. That's only because John Major couldn't possibly have carried it off convincingly. Rejoice. <laughs> oh, that's my mouth. I'm a caution, aren't I, real? <laughs> oh, no, don't mind me. I'm just a Prime Minister. I'm... Oh, no, go ahead, Neil. You say it. You say it so much better than I do.